The following program is a production of the Maine Public Broadcasting Network. The Penobscot Expedition is usually regarded as the worst American naval disaster, with the exception of Pearl Harbor. As a military event, it is one of the great unknowns in American history in general. Even biographies of Paul Revere don't usually mention the Penobscot campaign in any detail. They might mention that he partook of it and was command of the artillery, and along with the other officers, uh, was exonerated of blame by a court-martial. And that covers up the whole situation very nicely. But the Penobscot campaign simply is, is a uh, forgotten episode in most American histories. In June of 1779, the British make the decision to build a fort at the mouth of the Penobscot River to protect a Loyalist colony that will be called New Ireland. The Americans in Boston respond immediately and send an armada to stop the British. They call the mission the Penobscot Expedition. Over 200 years later, in August of 1998, Brewer resident Brent Finney was salvaging waterlogged lumber when he found something very unusual. I was almost out of air at the time I found it, so I looked around as quick as I could and then came back up to the boat and got another tank of air on as fast as I could go back down and look at it some more. Uh, and I guess I spent the rest of that air, air time down there looking the whole thing over and trying to go around and see what else is there. And some people think I was crazy, tell them there's cannons and cannonballs out there that people don't even know about the Penobscot expedition. So let's get it up and have the history where people can look at it. Brent Finney found what appeared to be an historic artifact. But what was it? Was it significant? And why was it lying on the bottom of the Penobscot River? In the end, his discovery sheds new light on the desperation of a nearly forgotten episode in Maine's history. Next, on Home, the story of Maine. Production of Home, the Story of Maine on MPBN was made in partnership with the Maine State Museum. Major funding was provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, a federal agency committed to fostering innovation, leadership, and a lifetime of learning. Additional funding was provided by Elsie Viles. During the following program, look for the main PBS web markers, which lead you to more information on our website. In 1998, Brent Finney was salvaging logs when he found two cannons and a swivel gun lying on the bottom of the Penobscot River. A year later, he discovered an old shipwreck nearby. Concerned that these artifacts might rot and disappear into oblivion, he contacted Warren Reese of the Darling Marine Center. That's, I uh, guess, when I contacted Warren Reese uh, and uh, told him they needed to get up here and get the stuff out of the river. He came up and talked to me, I guess, a couple times and explained how they do a lot of detail mapping and. Uh, before they just yank the stuff out of the river, which conserve the artifacts that they bring out. The winters here are particularly destructive to these sites. The shallow water sites, you can get ice forming two or three feet thick. The ice will form around artifacts, around pieces of ship. And as the tide comes in, lifts them up. And then it breaks up and takes them down river and drops them somewhere. In archeology, span we call it rafting. And that's been happening over the years. There's different erosion going on as the river has changed. 
Now, if we wanted to excavate them uh, and save the artifacts, bring up the hull and everything, they would let the University of Maine do that if we had enough financing and uh, to not only do it properly, but study it properly, publish it, conserve everything. Uh, the state of Maine just doesn't have that kind of money. The Navy does. They have their own underwater archaeology team. They have a conservation lab. And so it made most sense to bring them in, not only for their expertise and funding, but for protection of these sites. Once these sites are found, um, they can be looted. To oversee the excavation of the underwater site where the swivel gun was found, the Naval Historical Center calls on their team of investigators, including James Hunter, whose work combines history with underwater archaeology. I think that archaeology and history really complement one another, uh, especially when you integrate both equally. Uh, you find that certain things that are missing from the historical record are filled in by the archaeological record and vice versa. Now, I kind of suspected something was wrong when I first saw the gun underwater because a lot of the swivel guns that I have seen from other archaeological sites are very long and slender, elegant weapons. This was not the case with this gun. It was very stubby. And so I, I always kind of thought there was something wrong with it. And when they finally deconcreted it and I had a chance to look at it, I realized it's, it's true. <laughs> the muzzle's missing. So it was, it was very interesting. We do know that when the gun was made, it was flawed. Um, if you look at the gun dead on down the bore, you see that there's considerable thickness in the barrel wall on one side, and it's appreciably thinner on the other. So it appears that whoever made the gun, whether they drilled it or cast that bore, it was cast very much off center, um, which was not acceptable by any means. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, they continued to use the gun in spite of that. The swivel gun is manufactured during the American Revolution. Up to now, the majority of colonists are Protestant and consider themselves to be British citizens. With the help of the British, New Englanders have fought periodic wars against Native Americans and their Catholic French allies for nearly a hundred years. But now, a profound shift occurs. When the British demand to be repaid for their military assistance and impose a series of taxes on the colonists, the majority of colonial Americans rebel against what they perceive as British tyranny. In Maine, protesters in the town of Falmouth kidnap a British naval commander and rebels in Machias capture a royal vessel and kill her captain. To retaliate, the British burn Falmouth, and while their attempts to punish Machias fail, they do succeed in cutting off supplies to the town. American patriots do their best to protest British rule, but up to 20% of Americans remain loyal to the crown. These people are called Tories, or loyalists, and their lives become more difficult and dangerous as the revolution drags on. People would be loyalists for any number of reasons. One was the obvious feeling that the Americans couldn't win. And that's a very, very reasonable assumption throughout much of the revolution. Logic, reason, dictated that the Americans, with their disunity and their lack of organized military experience couldn't possibly win against so great a military naval uh, force and the political organization of the British Empire. Secondly, particularly after 1778, when the French alliance occurs, was fear of France. There's a long-standing tradition of hostility against Catholic France. Joining France was like joining the devil. And this is true. And of course, an unsuccessful revolution meant that they would be traitors. Britain and any country was very unsympathetic toward traitors. They beheaded or hanged or penalized in various ways people who were uh, regarded as traitors. I mean, I would be a loyalist, I think, uh, as I added up the causes like this. Loyalists also have a philosophical argument against independence. They believe that a man's oath is given before God, and that once a man has given his oath to the king, 
it cannot be broken, even if the king himself fails to live up to the agreement. In the town of Palmelboro, loyalist and Anglican reverend Jacob Bailey is pressured by patriot leaders again and again. Like other preachers, he is asked to read the Declaration of Independence from his pulpit. He refuses. And in 1776, when he refused to read the Declaration, and he did so on the argument that he, again, had given his oath to the crown. And then he said, and what about those who also have given their oath to the crown and broken it? What good is their oath? It's worthless, even if they give it now to the Continental Congress or to George Washington, their oaths have been forsworn. Their oaths are valueless. In the Declaration of Independence, American patriots list their complaints against George III. They argue that because the king has violated their trust, they are now free from their oaths of loyalty to him. The Declaration of Independence, the second half of which, lists all the ways that the king has broken his oath. He has sent troops. He has denied to Americans their rights as Englishmen. Loyalists deny that argument. He may have broken his oath. He may have sent armed troops to coerce our people, to burn our cities, to uh, uh, do all these things over and over and over again. But to the loyalists, he's still our king. And it's not us to separate ourselves from him. We cannot do that. Many loyalists are the target of boycotts and mob rule. They are no longer able to provide for their families, to protect the loyalists, and to alleviate the financial burden they represent. The British send 700 troops and three sloops of war to establish a loyalist colony and build a fort at present-day Castine. This new fort can also threaten Massachusetts and protect British shipping lines from the American privateers that are wreaking havoc on both merchant and military vessels. The Americans in Boston quickly discover the plan and requisition transports, privateers, and warships to try and stop the establishment of this new British colony. Initially, Massachusetts government officials are confident that they will win the battle, and they take the unusual step of insuring most of the ships in the Penobscot expedition. They provide financial guarantees for the safety of many of the private vessels that sail with the Armada. As the fleet makes its way from Boston to the Penobscot, the officers have orders to recruit 1,500 troops from militia units along the main coast. It's important to realize that the militia that was put on board these ships was pretty much uh, the low end of the spectrum. All the volunteers had left already. This was the middle of the revolution. The revolution had been going on for a few years. When they had a new call up for this expedition, they had the young boys who were just coming of age and the older fellows like about my age, you know, with a bad shoulder and a limp and, and whatever, uh, bad eyesight, uh, forming up this thousand troops that were put on board. They had never worked together as an army at all. In contrast to this ragged band of rebels, the British stationed at Fort George are well-trained and battle-hardened and have the advantage of the British Ordnance Board. Now, the British Ordnance Board was a group in England that was part of the, the British government, and their job was to make specifications for certain types of artillery. Uh, they basically standardized artillery aboard ships and also in uh, army field units. Uh, but one of their biggest responsibilities uh, was to ensure that the weapons that were being supplied to the British Navy and to the British Army were safe, and that they met the standards that the Ordnance Board had, had stipulated, and that these weapons would not injure their own gun crews. That was their main, their main purpose. Considering the strict regulations of the British Ordnance Board, Hunter immediately suspects that the swivel gun found in the Penobscot does not belong to the English. At the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab, the gun is x-rayed, and Hunter discovers something completely unexpected. 
Once they did a series of x-rays, they were able to show that there was, in fact, a piece of ammunition lodged in the barrel towards, towards the muzzle. Uh, it shows that you know, they were using a defective weapon and uh, paid for it. And a burst gun was never a good thing. Uh, most of the time when a cannon from this period exploded, it would kill at least one or two crew members uh, every time it happened. Uh, basically, it would be shrapnel. It would throw pieces of metal every direction. And uh, if you happen to be unfortunate enough to be standing right next to it, uh, it would either kill you or seriously disable you. Through the conservation process, archaeologists answer many questions about the swivel gun, but one question remains. Why is a gun that is so completely flawed and potentially dangerous still being used? To answer this question, it's necessary to look back more than 200 years in Maine's history. On July 19, 1779, approximately 40 American vessels leave Boston to fight the British at Castine. So they headed up to uh, Castine. The fleet got there. And they saw the British up on the hill. The British had leveled the trees, were starting to build a fort. And across the entrance to the harbor were three uh, small but uh, professional British ships anchored across the entrance to the harbor, showing their three broadsides out. The American warships then went in close to them to try to knock them out, push them out. But the Americans got the worst of it. And so the Americans backed off. And then they made a feint to land at a nice landing place. The British took the bait, went over there, and then the Americans landed actually um, in the face of a 100-foot cliff called Dice Head, very steep. And the Continental Marines that had been on the sh American ships uh, then stormed that heights. militia units on either side firing at the British. The British were up on top shooting down, dropping grenades on them, but they, the American Marines took the heights. Despite their lack of experience and heavy losses, the American Marines storm a 100-foot cliff and push back the British military machine. But then, just when the British commander is about to end the battle and surrender Fort George, the American general commands his troops to stop their offensive and dig in for trench warfare. And so as the British commander stood there with his mouth wide open, the, the Americans stopped and started digging in. And it was just one of those unbelievably, you know, it was a clear example of a colonial leader who didn't understand warfare. Both the British and the Americans have faulty intelligence and both believe that they are outnumbered. The American general is determined to wait for support from the American Navy before storming the fort. At the same time, the American Navy admiral believes that his ships will be sunk by the three British sloops of war, and he also refuses to attack. Plus, the British could be hiding all kinds of artillery in the woods surrounding the har harbor, and the wind was blowing straight into the harbor. They got into a trap, they couldn't get out. So here was the fort, the American troops around it, uh, the Navy wouldn't go in, and they had this, this standoff for a while. The American general said, look, um, you go in to, he said, this is the naval commander, he says, you go and take those three vessels out, and then I'll attack the fort. And the naval commander says, no, no, no. He says, you go take the fort, and then I'll go after the vessels. Every day for two weeks, the American commanders argue, trying to decide whether the American Army or the American Navy will attack the British first. During the debates, a secretary takes notes, keeping record of how each commander voted. And then the last line would be, and Mr. Revere votes to go home. This was Paul Revere. Paul Revere was there with the ordnance vessel, which carried all the armaments, the guns, and all of that. And he obviously figured he had spent enough time up there and it was time to leave. So he was not making a good name for himself in this instance. Finally, couriers from Massachusetts deliver stern orders to the American commanders to take the fort. Now that they agree to work cooperatively, a victory is almost guaranteed. But then, on August 13th, when the commanders have finally settled their differences, 
and the troops are preparing for the attack. British reinforcements appear on the horizon. And lo and behold, here shows up the British war fleet of seven ships. However, this seven ships included a 64, which means a 64 gun vessel, several 32s, and it was a formidable fleet. The best the, the Americans had was one 32. Seeing that they are trapped, one vessel, the Defense, tries to hide behind Sears Island, but is quickly discovered by the British. Her captain orders all the men ashore and scuttles the ship. The rest of the American fleet attempts to escape up the Penobscot River, but the wind and the tide are against them. There was almost no wind, and the current as it ebbs out of the Penobscot is very powerful. So everybody anchored when the tide was going out, and when the tide would be coming in, they'd haul up anchor, they'd send their boats out ahead and tow as best they could, rowing all the way. The British have larger ships and taller masts. Their topsails catch the slight breeze, allowing them to inch their way toward the Americans. It becomes clear that the smallest American ships will be caught. The Americans drive them on the beach at Sandy Point and light fire to them. The men escape into the woods. At least 15 ships are lost there. You can just envision the chaos that this must have involved. Ships uh, uh, sailing up, ramming one another in their haste to get ashore. Troops mutinying against their own officers in their haste to get ashore and get back into the woods in safety and get out of the way of this formidable British fleet. On a desperate flight from the British fleet, the Americans deliberately burn and sink 35 of their own ships and throw an untold number of munitions overboard to keep them out of British hands. Maine's history has unlocked the secrets of the swivel gun that Brent Finney found. Now archaeologist James Hunter is clear that it once belonged to a desperate band of American rebels. Seeing it on the bottom, its provenience on the bottom, laying in a scatter of artillery, a scatter of munitions, gives you a real sense of what things were like in the very last hours of the Penobscot expedition for the American forces. They were panicked. They didn't know what to do. The British were coming up the river. They had nowhere to go. You know, there were 10 ships bottlenecked at the end of this river, and they didn't know what to do. And they figured the best thing that they could do was to take everything that they had that could be of use to their enemy and get rid of it, just throw it overboard. We always hear in history about how the Americans had it very difficult. You know, they were undermanned, they were underarmed, they didn't have a lot of money, they were not very well trained. And you see a swivel gun like this, which is clearly damaged, it was clearly cast wrong, and it was something that would have never made its way into a European army, and yet it's being used. And then I think it, it gives you a very tangible sense of the desperation that the Americans were enduring at the time. And to this day, the chaos is, was so great that no one can accurately say what the loss to the Americans were. Nobody really knows, except that the army was totally dismantled by this experience. And Massachusetts was left with an horrendous bill because it had insured all these vessels. It had paid for all the equipment. It had organized the army. Because so many ships are lost during the expedition, Massachusetts is now liable for millions of pounds sterling. This cripples their ability to contribute to the revolution. The Loyalists stay in Castine until the end of the revolution, when Maine becomes part of the new nation. At that point, some of them dismantle their homes and rebuild them on Passamaquoddy land in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, where they stand today. The consequences of losing the Penobscot expedition uh, were far-reaching. So the whole eastern half of Maine was taken away because we lost that paddle. It was very depressing, I think, to, to the people of the province of Maine and uh, New Englanders in general to see the British gathering that much property uh, from that one loss. Uh, but they recovered. The Penobscot expedition was pivotal in the movement to separate Maine from Massachusetts, largely through 
the fact that it was a military and financial disaster, which meant Massachusetts could no longer protect Maine from the British. And this laid the basis for the argument that since Massachusetts did not defend Maine, Maine owed very little, if anything, to Massachusetts. And given the revolutionary ideology of self-determination of a separate peoples, Maine being separate from Massachusetts anyway, could logically be an entity unto itself. If you'd like to learn more about the American Revolution in Maine, log on to our website at www.mainepbs.org. Production of Home, the Story of Maine on MPBN was made in partnership with the Maine State Museum. Major funding was provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, a federal agency committed to fostering innovation, leadership, and a lifetime of learning. Additional funding was provided by Elsie Viles.